management of neck swelling in pediatrics. Each side of the neck is divided by sternomastoid muscle into two main triangles, anterior triangle and the posterior triangle. This is sternomastoid muscle. The anterior triangle is having the boundaries of anterior border of sternomastoid muscle, the midline, and the inferior margin of the mandible. And this triangle is further subdivided into four triangles by the anterior belly of digastric muscle, posterior belly of digastric muscle, and the superior belly of omohoid. And the triangles are submental triangle, submandibular triangle, carotid triangle, and muscular triangle. The posterior triangle of the neck is having the boundaries of posterior border of sternomastoid muscle, the anterior boundary of the uh, trapezius muscle or anterior border of the trapezius muscle and the middle one third of the clavicle. Uh, this triangle is uh, subdivided into two triangles by the inferior belly of omohoid into occipital triangle and the supraclavicular triangle. The location of the lumps within the neck can sometimes be useful in narrowing the differential diagnosis, particularly when combined with other clinical findings and investigation results. Now, neck veins are divided into developmental, inflammatory, and neoplastic. The developmental are thyroglossal duct cyst, dermoid cyst, and brachial cyst, and vascular and lymphatic malformations. And these are uh, in different uh, triangles of the neck, like thyroglossal and derm dermoid, they are in the submental triangle. Similarly, inflammatory, like uh, reactive lymphadenopathy, lymphadenitis, and sialadenitis, they are in the submental triangle. Malignant lymphadenopathy and benign connective tissue tumor, they are also in the submental triangle. So, malignant lymphadenopathy and benign connective tissue tumor, they are almost uh, in all the triangles of the neck and uh, the thyroid tumor, goiter, thyroid, uh, thyroglossal cyst, and uh, dermoid cyst, they are uh, in the midline. So they are the midline uh, swellings. Brinkle cyst arises from the embryological remnants of the second branchial cleft in the neck and the solitary smooth cyst is most often located in the anterior triangle. And usually it's painless, but may be painful during acute infection. Thyroglossal cyst is the persistence of the thyroglossal duct by which the thyroid gland descends during embryological development to its final position in the front of the neck. The other end is on the uh, foramen cecum of the tongue. The tongue is attached to the thyroglossal ducts. That is why thyroglossal cyst rises during tongue protrusion. The dermoid cyst is formed along the lines of embryological fusion and present as a painless swelling that do not move with tongue protrusion. The lymph nodes may be solitary or often multiple and they are associated with underlying infection or malignancy. Ludwig's angina is a rapidly progressive, severe soft tissue infection of the neck and the floor of the mouth. And this is the swelling and it compromises the airway. So early recognition and prompt management are important to avoid life-threatening acute airway obstruction. Stick hygroma is a congenital lymphatic lesion. This result of a failure of the lymphatics to connect to the venous system so that lymph gets collected in various pockets and the swelling gets enlarged, which ultimately uh, compromises the airway. It can arise anywhere, but typically develops in the left posterior triangle of the neck. Tumor neck 
they are the neoblasts and approximately 5% of all childhood malignancies uh, are there and uh, severe hemodynamic effects are there due to the proximity of great blood vessels and decompression induced by surgical removal. So uh, we have to be very careful about uh, the blood loss uh, part during surgery. Neck swellings may uh, present as a huge swelling or a very uh, small lesion and uh, it uh, may be there for elective surgery or in emergency surgery. Ludwig's angina and deep neck abscess like retropharyngeal, parapharyngeal abscess, which are deep neck uh, abscesses, they are there in emergency and um, incision and drainage is um, uh, uh, done. Though it's a short procedure, but it's very uh, dangerous uh, for the child uh, as far as the airway compromise uh, is uh, there uh, and in elective surgery the other types of cyst though swellings are very huge but there are time for the anesthesiologist to get prepared for um, uh, those uh, swellings now pre-operative evaluation requires uh, to ask for the C for the signs and symptoms of airway compression respiratory distress cuff strider tachypnea dysphagia and dyspnea Size and extent of the neck mass is to be noticed to detect the potential for airway compromise and to avoid soft tissue trauma during intubation uh, with a consequent acute airway obstruction. Now, genetic abnormalities are mostly associated with uh, cystic hygroma and various syndrome like Noonan, Turner, then Down syndrome, Klinfelter, trisomies. In Down syndrome, atlantoaxial uh, the instability is there. And in Klinfelter syndrome, uh, the various cervical um, uh, vertebrae, they get fused. So um, intubation difficulty is uh, there apart from the large size of the uh, swelling, which is impinging upon the airway. Then airway potency and stability is uh, to be checked uh, to rule out whether the extent of the difficult airway. Then inspiratory stridor suggests supraglottic obstruction, while expiratory stridor is associated with a subglottic or intrathoracic uh, obstruction. The cervical masses may be adherent to or they cause compression of the great vessels or they extend into the mediastinum. So assess the respiratory status in different positions to assess for compression of the mediastinal structures. Then if there is evidence of congenital cardiac disease, it has to be noted down. Then surgical consultation for concerns regarding neck surgery with respect to timing, duration, blood loss, and post-operative support has to be there. Investigations, normally for a small lesion, uh, the not much of the investigations are required because babies are healthy. But otherwise, in bigger swellings, uh, CBC, platelet count, INR, then electrolytes, blood glucose, uh, creatinine, blood urea, and 2D echo if uh, associated congenital cardiac anomaly is there. And the important investigations are ultrasonography, chest X-ray, CT scan, and MRI, because they help in judging the size, position, and extent of involvement, position of the tongue relative to the mass, soft structures, soft tissues, supraglottic as well as infraglottic. And uh, also the vascularity of the lesion. So these are very important investigations. Pre-medication is usually not necessary in less than six months. And most common route is used uh, uh, oral, uh, but oral is slow in onset and the child may spit it out. IM is painful, rectal is uncomfortable, and nasal is irritating. There's a great variation in the recommendations for pre-medication of pediatric patients. but in patients with anticipated airway compromise, pre-medication is avoided. Otherwise, oral midazolam 
0.5 milligram per kg 30 minutes prior to procedure may be uh, given. Monitoring, all the monitors are uh, required in large swellings. Otherwise, basic standard monitors are should be there in uh, case of small lesions. Temperature should be maintained by keeping the OT warm, warm IV fluids, irrigating solutions, warm towels wrapping, uh, wrapped around the head and extremities, and heated blankets, forced air convection units, and of course, if heat and air moisture exchange filters are available. Flexible fiber optic bronchoscope is the gold standard of difficult airway management in pediatric patients. But in the presence of parapharyngeal masses, fiber optic bronchoscopy alone may not do good sometimes, and it has to be aided with direct laryngoscopy. That means uh, with the aid of uh, laryngoscope, the soft tissue can be displaced and then the fiber optic um, uh, bronchoscope can be advanced. Now, video laryngoscopes may be helpful when chosen according to the anatomy and side of the mask. That means glide scope should be used with caution in parapharyngeal masses because glide scope enters in the midline while the parapharyngeal masses it is on the left, on the right side. So CMAC is the better option for left-sided parapharyngeal mass because it, it's convenient to go from the side and display, display, uh, displace it and the, visualize the uh, glottis. Ultrasound guided intubation is um, coming up nowadays. So ultrasound has recently been used to visualize airway structures and endotracheal intubation in real time in pediatric patients. Uh, it may be considered during difficult intubation when there is a trained operator, but insufficient evidence to recommend this method routinely is not justified. Anticipated difficult airway has some steps which are to be followed and uh, these are to be uh, in the, included in the plan, plan A, plan B, plan C to deal with the difficult airway um, management. If there is difficult back mask ventil uh, ventilation, then do all sort of things, check all the things, insert an orophangial airway, optimize patient position, use two hands, CPAP is given, adequate depth of anesthesia should be there, otherwise chances of laryngospasma may be uh, there. So, and one has to see whether there is gastric distension or not, because when the bag mass ventilation is being done, uh, not very um, carefully, the chances are there that uh, uh, gastric distension is there. So, so diaphragm gets splinted and uh, um, there is difficulty in, in, in the back mass uh, ventilation. So if difficult mass ventilation persists, insert a supraglottic airway device. If the surgery can be performed in SAD, and adequate ventilation is there, it can be performed. If surgery is such that endotracheal intubation is required, then fibroptic intubation can be done through supraglottic airway device and the surgery can be proceeded. But if there is inadequate ventilation with SAD and saturation is rapidly is not not rapidly declining, so it's better to wake up the patient and postpone the surgery. If bag mask ventilation is easy, but uh, intubation is difficult, so then switch over to indirect techniques like video laryngoscopy or fiber optic uh, bronchoscopy. But limit the number of unsuccessful attempts because multiple attempts, they increase the risk of serious complications. And consider using bougie or even ultrasound. And uh, if tracheal um, uh, intubation is unsuccessful, you can place SAD and then the plan as we discussed should be like that. Now, difficult airway society 
uh, and the Association of Pediatric Anesthetists, uh, they have formed pediatric uh, guidelines for unanticipated difficult mass ventilation and difficult tracheal intubation. Once that means once the baby is induced, and then these um, unanticipated um, uh, uh, difficulty appears. So this DAS, uh, these DAS guidelines, they are for children one to eight years. And uh, this I'm just uh, telling briefly uh, because these guidelines and um, All India guidelines, they are important. And because this is a sort of difficult um, uh, air and compromised airway. So instead, uh, 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 apart from uh, knowing uh, the anticipated uh, difficult mask, uh, difficult uh, uh, airway, you should also know the unanticipated because this is also important. Now the steps are that uh, if uh, bag mass ventilation fail, then you have to uh, insert a shoulder roll. And if uh, supraglottic airway uh, device is inserted and uh, uh, not more than three attempts are to be taken, uh, taken. Uh, if the airway is not good, saturation is more than 80%, so it's better to wake up the patient. And if saturation is going down, try intubating the patient with paralysis to avoid CICV situation. Otherwise, you may land up in can't intubate, can't ventilation setup. Now, if Bag mass ventilation is good, but intubation is difficult. Not more than four attempts should be taken. And then you can switch over to straight blade or video laryngoscopy. If intubation is failed, then SAD is used, but not more than three attempts. And one attempt of fibroptic intubation via SAD should be given. If failed oxygenation, SpO2 less than 90%, it's better to uh, wake up the uh, patient. In All India Difficult Airway Association guidelines for unanticipated difficult tracheal intubation in pediatrics, age is 1 to 12 years. And optimum technique is the head in neutral position and shoulder roll in less than three, uh, six uh, months. Nasal insufflation of oxygen during apnea in all patients is very much required and call for help. Maximum number of attempts at intubation is two. If SPO2 is more than 95%, there's adequate oxygenation, depth of anesthesia, optimal equipment, positioning, external angel manipulation, they should all be covered up to facilitate the intubation. But if intubation fails, supraglottic airway devices, particularly second generation, it's been stressed, um, stress the second generation device should be um, advised and two attempts should be there. And through this supraglottic airway device, uh, 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 fiber optic uh, bronchoscopy and intubation can be done. And other uh, thing is similar that if SAD insertion fail, one final attempt at mass massive ventilation should be tried after ensuring neuromuscular blocking. If mass ventilation is successful, it's better to wake up the patient and postpone the surgery. Otherwise, if ventilation is still not possible, emergency surgical airway access. So a large neck swelling may result in deviation of the trachea and emergency surgical airway would be uncertain uh, because of large swelling. So crucial points in the management of a difficult airway, especially in infants, are help from senior colleagues, no prestige issue, surgical teamwork, avoidance of muscle relaxants, and use of inhalational anesthesia, and knowing when to abandon the procedure to avoid adverse events. Anesthetic consideration, emergency for enlarged, uh, anesthetic consideration for enlarged uh, neck swelling. Emergency airway car should be ready, IV line should be secured, atropine is given, Fiber optic bronchoscope, video laryngoscope, SAD, it should be available. Mask induction with sevoflurane, 
Gently assist ventilation as the plane of anesthesia deepens and perform laryngoscopy and endotracheal intubation. Once the airway is secured, neuromuscular blockade is given, rocuronium, vacuronium, or atropuron. An endotracheal tube must be secured carefully. Prevent accidental excavation and endobronchial uh, intubation during surgeon's intraoral examination and extensive cervical manipulation during surgery. Avoid tension on the endotracheal tube by the circuit tubings and reverse neuromuscular blockade with the neostigmine and atropine and extubate the baby when fully awake. Regarding fluid therapy, pre-op fluid deficit normally two hour fasting for clear fluid, so not much is required, but if more hours of fasting is there, then multiply the hourly maintenance by number of hours of fluid restriction and replace 50% in first hour and 25-25% in, uh, in next second and third hour. Then holiday and cigar formula provides maintenance fluid requirement, particularly in new needs, 4 to 8 ml per kg glucose of is required for brain development and they have limited glycogen reserve and they are susceptible to hypoglycemia. So 1 to 2% dextrose solution is required for these dual needs. Then replacement for intraoperative losses is with uh, isotonic solutions, colloids, and blood based on the child's hematocrit. Maximum bl allowable blood loss is uh, calculated. And if it is less than one third, then balanced salt solution is uh, the replacement uh, yeah, solution. And the ratio of balanced uh, solution to volume of blood loss is 3 is to 1. If it's more than one third, then colloid come into picture with a ratio of one is to one. And if it's uh, more than one uh, MABL, then blood transfusion is required. The intraoperative complications are dislodgement of endotracheal tube with loss of airway, laryngospasm, bronchospasm, and massive hemorrhage. Pain management is with multimodal analgesia, estaminophen, ventanil, infiltration of local anesthesia at incision site. And dexim is, uh, dexmedutidine is uh, um, maybe um, uh, given uh, upon emergence for uh, small um, uh, swellings uh, uh, because it, sometimes it produces sedation which is not required in uh, airway surgery. Now, post-operatively, if it's so small lesion, then extubate it in the operating room. But if it's, it's been an extensive lesion, extubation is delayed, shifted to ICU for extubation. Once the airway edema subsides, may take 24 to 72 hours. Adequate analgesia is established. And holiday and Sager half strength to 1.5 is given in the first 12 hours due to ADH secretion. And uh, then uh, it's resumed to normal maintenance after checking the electrolyte. Post-op complications are subglottic edema, hematoma, then upper area obstruction from edema related to tumor resection. And so many uh, nerves are going through neck. So Horner syndrome, recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy, paralysis of 7th, 11th, and 12th cranial nerves due to traction of the nerves during surgery. And it is generally reversible. Now, few points regarding emergency delirium. Now, post-operative disorientation and agitation is there uh, with pain, hypoxia, hypocarbia, hypoglycemia, full bladder, Emergence delirium is hyperactive psychomotor and aberrant cognitive behaviors which follow general anesthesia and culprits are uh, desflurane, sevoflurane, rapid emergence, age less than five years, post-operative pain in surgical procedures, uh, which are around head and neck. Then uh, there are various scales. Pediatric anesthesia, emergence uh, delirium scale, PEED scale uh, is having eye contact, purposeful movement, awareness surroundings, restlessness, in consolability points. And a score of more than 12 is uh, 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 to designate uh, the emergency delirium. The other scales, which are much easier, comfortable, and very simple, Gravero and Bacha scale. 
remedy is propofol, or fentanyl, or mirazolam. So anticipating difficult airway problem in children and having a structured approach to manage the airway prevents the serious consequences of perioperative hypoxia. Thank you.